Welcome everybody to the, this live recording of this podcast with Professor Roger Allen, who I am thrilled to have on the series. Uh, professor Allen served as a professor of Arabic and Compar comparative literature in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at the University of Pennsylvania for 43 years. Uh, from 2005 to 2011, he served as chair of the department. He was a president of the nation's Association of Middle East uh, Specialists, MESA, in 2005. 2010 to 2011. Roger uh, obtained his doctoral degree in modern Arabic literature from Oxford University in 1968, the first student to obtain a doctoral degree in that field at Oxford under the supervision uh, of M.M. Badawi. Dr. M. M. Bedouin. In the late 1960s, Roger Allen began to concentrate his research on modern Arabic fiction. In the late 1960s, he began to concentrate uh, his research on modern Arabic fiction. He's translated uh, work by Najib Mahfouz, Jabra Ibrahim Jabra, uh, Abdul Rahman Munif, uh, and many, many others, uh, which we will talk about later. He's published many scholarly books, including the 1982 book, The Arabic Novel, Historical and Critical Introduction, and The Arabic uh, Literary Heritage in 1998 both of which have been widely used throughout the world at many universities and are um, highly regarded. His research interests have focused on a number of issues within the broader field of Arabic literature, the problems of evaluation of literary works within the complexities of a post-colonial situation, the urgent need to rewrite the literary history of most regions of the Arab world to reflect new understandings concerning the relative significance of different cultural trends, and the status of fictional genres in the Arab world in the new era of alternative means of publication and indeed new media. Above all, it continues to be Roger Allen's hope to maintain and increase the kinds of academic, scholarly, and personal contact between Western specialists and Arab writers and critics, and that being the most important development to have occurred during the course of his now 43-year-long career. Over that career, he has taught many generations of students, now including some of the most distingu distinguished members of the younger generation of Arab uh, specialists in Arab literature. Roger, welcome to Africa Conversations. Thank you very much. It is an honor to have you here. Um, it's a pleasure. And <laughs> so I guess uh, usually I like to condense bios, but the reason why I wanted to uh, read a more long form bio is to illustrate and to demonstrate how much you have done um, over the course of your career. And I guess I, the first question I'll ask you is, do you feel like you have done a lot over this career or do you still look at it and think, I really haven't done as much as I've wanted to do. Well, I mean, to give it a, a bit of context, of course, the study of, of literature, um, as Terry Eagleton points out in his book, Literary Theory, is not of any great vintage. And my career essentially is part of a process whereby the study of other cultures moves from a philologically based system uh, of preparing texts and even translating texts to the actual interpretation of texts and the analysis and the development of theoretical bases upon which to judge that. I'd remind you, of course, that modern Arabic, and the, the study of anything in modern Arabic really begins with Gib initially in England, and Kratzkowski in Russia, and that's in the late 1920s. But as you pointed out, I was and am the first person ever to get a doctorate in a field called modern Arabic literature, because even when I was an undergraduate at Oxford, and for some curious reason, which my fellow students couldn't understand, read Manfaluti and Moelhe and these people it's like, why are you studying that stuff? Why aren't well, why, you studying? Why were you? Because here's a secret. Uh, I grew up in the British system and I was designated a classical scholar at the age of 15, that being the old British system. Yeah. I got a scholarship to Oxford in classics, including all delightful things like Latin and Greek prose composition and verse composition, translating Byron into Greek iambics. You know, and it was in my first year at Oxford, my freshman year in February, I had what you might call this Damascus Road experience. 
I simply asked myself, why am I doing this? Yeah. And I didn't come up with an answer, nor did any of my tutors, other than the fact that you're studying classics at Oxford. I mean, the world's your oyster, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, I want to do something different. And it was Professor Beeston who said, who took out a map, showed me a map and said, look, here is Europe, Spain, France, Italy, Balkans, Greece. Now look at the south of here. Every single country speaks or studies or co operates in a single language. Surely there's got to be something to interest you there. And indeed, that's what triggered my interest. I started Arabic without any previous knowledge or any background whatsoever. It was a total gamble. But it was when I went to Lebanon at the end of my second year to the Shemlan Arabic school, I arrived in Beirut to the shock. People on the street were speaking Arabic. I mean, they were speaking Arabic. Yeah. I, and uh, as you've put up, there's Badawi, who is Can the I first person appointed to teach modern Arabic at Oxford as a result of a movement which also occurred in the United States, the NDEA Act, which simply said, as a result of the Second World War, our ability to negotiate with, deal with, understand the contemporary Arabic speaking world is totally miserable. Indeed, other world cultures as well. And in England, the Hater Report established a position at Oxford in modern Arabic and particularly its literature. And the major mover in that, of course, was Albert Harani, the, yeah. the great historian. But that's what got me started. And I, I, I often say I express my gratitude to Britain and my education by immediately emigrating to the United States, where I took <laughs> up the position at the University of Pennsylvania. And I really have the impression that my career is actually coterminous with the beginnings of the development in literature studies of something which is paralleled in other disciplines, political science, international relations, history, yeah. which is engagement with the Arabic speaking world in whatever you think the modern period is. And uh, yes, I, I do really feel that uh, through my own work, but also through the wonderful series of students I've been able to educate, that that is indeed part of the process of developing a discipline of modern Arabic literature studies. I want to go back to something that you said, um, just to understand exactly what you mean. You said when I got to Beirut, they were speaking Arabic, as, yes. which is, uh, that's an obvious statement. Do, did you mean that in contrast to if you had gone to Rome, they're not speaking Latin? No. What I mean by that is at Oxford, we were being taught Arabic exactly the same way as I'd been taught Latin and Greek before that. Yeah, as if it were a dead language. And you know, we were using the Reverend Thatcher's Arabic grammar. And I continually quote my favorite sentence from that book. The lame girl is in the yellow room. I mean, that's the sort of stuff we're doing. Okay, afal, fa'le, uh, adjectives of color and defects and all this stuff, but that's what we were doing. There was no engagement whatsoever with the modern Arabic language. The fact that you know, the, there is a colloquial dialect and any engagement at all with anything modern in Arabic. I mean, the, the, the set of texts I had to study as an undergraduate was terrifying. The Quran, the Sahih, Ibn, Ibn Khaldun, um, pre-Islamic poetry and jahis. Yeah, and I made this incredible decision to study what they called the special paper in modern Arabic. Yeah, but, but then I actually got to read Manfulti, for heaven's sake. Uh, we didn't read Tahir Hussain's Alayyam. We didn't read Tawfir al-Hakim. That's one of the first things that uh, Badawi did when he arrived. He completely changed the syllabus for the study of modern Arabic. Yeah. So oh, and um, there he is, al <laughs> Yeah. So I'm curious um, if you reflect back at um, your, your thesis advisor, uh, Dr. Badawi, um, 
had you gone somewhere else, had you not gone to Oxford, um, do you feel like you would have had a completely different trajectory? Do you look back at that time um, fondly or do you think that was a huge waste oh, of my very time? Very much so. Okay. Um, no, the, Oxford had a problem with my doctoral defense because Badawi, as my supervisor, could not be on the defense program. The only other person in, in Britain with the qualifications was Pierre Kakia at Edinburgh. He was lecturer in modern Arabic. He was never made professor by Edinburgh, which is a scandal, but that's another subject. Uh, but because of that, they had to bring in Albert Horani to be the second person on my 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 um, defense because modern Arabic was sort of available in Edinburgh. And I think, um, I forget who it was, a lecturer in, in, at SOAS may have offered the odd course, but mm. modern Arabic, uh, you know, in general was not a valid subject for teaching and research at that it's amazing. particular time. It's not that long ago. It's, a, it's amazing. Well, we're talking yeah. 1967, 1968. Yeah. Yes. So that uh, that thesis later became a period of time, um, this first yes. book. So I want to uh, zoom into the 60s, um, the late 60s. Um, you decide to go and actually engage with this modern Arab world, this contemporary Arab world, um, yes. which I suppose... It seemed crazy to some of your uh, professors. Oh, totally. um, tell the story about how you first um, how you first met Najib Mahfouz in 1967. Uh, well, um, my supervisor Mo Badawi uh, had a very close colleague and friend in Cairo, Magdi Wahba, who was professor of English at Cairo University. World Secretary of the Samuel Johnson Foundation, so a, a, a real Anglophile, and as it so happened, uh, Under Secretary of State for Culture, when Tharwat Okasha was the Minister of Culture, and um, he knew about my interest in modern Arabic, and so one day he said to me, "Would you like to go and meet Najib Mahfouz?" And I said, "You kidding?" Yeah. So we hopped in his car, went over the Abel El Bridge into Zamalek turned right on Mahat Sri Sri Street, and the first building there belonged to the Ministry of Culture. And we went to meet the head of the film censorship board, namely one Nagi Mahfouz. All the young Egyptian authors who I met when I was in Cairo pointed out Mahfouz was a really strict censor. <laughs> He would cut stuff out. And I said, well, you know, but we went into his office and I don't know if you know this, but he always wore dark glasses uh, outside because he has a very bad eye condition. And I went in there and he, he apologized for the fact the room was completely dark. And he explained to me that he had this eye condition and that Cairo was not the place to have a bad eye condition if you didn't like sunlight. <laughs> but there he was. He asked me what I was doing. I said I was working on Hadith Isa ibn Hisham by al mulhi His face lit up. He said, I love that book. My father made me, re made me remember, memorize entire paragraphs of it. Wow. And he took me to meet Muel uh, just a, a year or so before he died. He said, but that has been a central book in, in my uh, literary background and upbringing. And I said, oh. Then, of course, he went on to say, um, do you do any translation? And I said, yes, actually. Uh, I've been translating some of your short stories, your extremely cryptic short stories, after the Nexa, he published the whole collection of them. He didn't publish any novels for quite a while. Um, with an Egyptian colleague who is doing a doctorate on you at New York University. His name's Akif Abadir. Uh, and he said, well, would you like to translate some of my novels? And I said, yes, of course. He said, well, choose one. And I chose a Samanwa Kharif from 19, uh, 1962. But... The collection, God's World, which you've got up now, um, 
was the collection that we put together, that's Akif Abadir and myself, which was sent to the Nobel Committee and is cited in the award of the Nobel to Mahfouz. Mm-hmm. And uh, Mahfouz, whenever I went to see him, always said, I'll never forget God's world arriving because it arrived on my birthday. And that's the kind of thing he would always bring up every time I went to see him. And this uh, was an introduction, of course, to another aspect of his writing. It, it tends to get forgotten that Mahfouz's first published work was a collection of short stories. And then the next series of three were all uh, based in ancient Egypt. There's a very clear reason for that. Mahfouz, I don't know if you know this, was the youngest child in his family by 15 years. As oh. he pointed out, I seem to have been a somewhat late... Uh, Arrival to the party. (laughs) Mistake, arrival, whatever. And he said, my mother used to take me to the Egyptian museum every week. Mm. And occasionally she'd take me to the pyramids as well. So he had an ongoing fascination with ancient Egypt. And there are not only those three initial novels um, from the 1930s, 1939, 40 and 41, but he went back and wrote about Akhenaton and other things later on in his career. Yeah. But, um, th- so there's this curious connection between Al Muelhe and Mahfouz. <laughs> and, so, no, no go keep ahead. going. No, no, put, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish. Well, I'm just saying, you know, the, yeah. that I, what interested me was the way in which he actually attributed to his reading of that book and above all, the fact that that could arguably be said, even if it's not a novel, uh, but it's a collection of newspaper articles. And my last published work uh, before I retired was the Library of Arabic Literature, what Asaf and Hishan told us from the Library yeah. of Arabic Literature, which is for the first time, the publication of the original newspaper articles, mm. not the book, uh, but um, that he regarded that work as perhaps the first serious narrative criticism of contemporary society in Egypt at the turn of the century. And that clearly, uh, according to what he would explain to me at that first meeting and thereafter, was significant in his own development. Yeah. So I have a question, two, two questions about Mahfouz before we keep on. I'm sure there'll be more questions in the, from the audience about him. Um, the first is, I'm curious, when he said, uh, pick any book you want uh, to translate, is that experience, uh, uh, is that an exciting prospect for you? Is it a nerve wracking prospect? Is it kind of a pain in the ass? Or are you like, oh my God, let me, let me get my hands on one of them. I mean, what does it feel like to dive into something like that? Yeah, well, um, there were a number of novels from the 60s. I mean, there's a whole literature about uh, the, well, the Egyptological novels, then the quarter novels culminating mm-hmm. in the trilogy, then the gap, then Aulad Haritna, about which I've written at, at great length because yeah. the publication of the English versions of that is somewhat messy. Um, but the novels of the 1960s, he told me specifically, I'm doing something different. Yeah. And I chose Saman Kharif because its subject is the revolution itself. Uh, That particular process, it, it, it starts before the revolution and it goes through the revolution and it's its consequences. And that's what at the time interested me. So that's why I chose that particular one. Okay. My second question is, do you have to like somebody to want to translate them? And what was, what was Mahfouz like? Did you like his company? What was his personality? Like I've heard you say he was extremely organized and, and tidy. What was his personality? Like, did you, did you like, the the man the guy he had always a, 
an incredibly ready sense of humor. Mm. Uh, he was always polite. He was keen to listen all the time. Uh, he would ask me questions and we would have discussions. Um, but frequently after the, it, those discussions would end with a one or two word retort, which was, which was humorous. Yeah. Always a uh, great sense of humor. And you no, know, this photograph you've got up now is taken on the houseboat. He used to go out before he got, uh, assaulted with a knife in 1994. He used to go out every day of the week uh, except um, Friday to a different place. Okay. And uh, some of them will be public. This one wasn't public. This is on, it's called Farah Boat, and it's moored alongside the Sheraton in Dukki in Cairo. And I would be taken there by Gamal Hitani, who was one of his very closest friends. Mm. And um, also um, a, a number of other writers would be there and I would be admitted to this particular group. Um, regarding your first question, I, don't, I can't think of any single author who I've translated who I found in any way other than a delight to work with. Okay. Now, well, of course, uh, as I say, I had a telephone uh, relationship with Yusuf Idris. Yeah. And Yusuf Idris was really ticked with me uh, at the Marabid Festival in Baghdad in 1988, because he had heard that I had nominated Mahfouz, and he had made a huge fuss in Egypt saying that Mahfouz wasn't worthy, and he was. And I had to point out to Yusuf Idris that, look, the Nobel Prize Committee does not read Arabic. They read English, German, Swedish, and probably either Spanish or Italian, and the membership changes, but they don't read Arabic. So you have to be translated, and you have to be well translated, and you aren't. Now I, yeah. I've done. I had done this collection, and uh, Wadi Wadi Wasif had done a, a, a collection of Yusuf Idris as well. Uh, but his genius for the short story was not well reflected in translation, and particularly, uh, I, I am not sure even today whether there is a single work of Yusuf Idris translated into French. Somebody mm. might be able to prove me wrong, but at the time that was certainly the case. And you not only had for the Nobel Committee, you had to have translations, but you had to have translations into a variety of languages, not yeah. just one. And um, so that was Yusuf Idris. But I mean, we got together because, you know, I published this collection. I published a, a collection of articles um, which were published by um, Three Continents Press, a Critical Introduction to Yusuf Idris, a series of articles. So, I mean, he actually telephoned me from the Cleveland Clinic shortly before he died um, because he was being treated for his heart condition, which eventually killed him uh, in a London hospital. So, you know, it, it was sort of okay, but if there was anybody who was a, a bit tricky, then it was Yusuf Idris. Um, what was it like... Uh when uh, Mahfouz won the, won the Nobel Peace Prize, were you in, con in conversation with him constantly? Were you sort of beside yourself? Um, what was the actual emotion when that happened? That, there's a long history to this, you see. Uh, I have to here acknowledge that the primary figure responsible for him winning the prize was the Palestinian poet and critic, Salma Jayousi. Salma Jayousi was very close friends with Sigrid Kaila, who was a Swedish scholar of poetry and was absolutely crazy about the poetry of Adonis. She organized a conference in Lund in Sweden, invited Salma, entirely devoted to Adonis. 
Sigrid and Salma then went to Stockholm and were invited to the Swedish Academy and met the uh, representatives of the Nobel Committee for Literature. They were taken to see the library and Salma wrote to me and said, the library of the Swedish Academy in Arabic is pathetic. She said, the only book they've got on the novel happens to be your book. So I said, well, that's very nice. She said, yeah, but there are about 20 other titles and that's it. So yeah. the Swedish Academy got really guilty, bought books. And then in 1986, they sent Salma a request for reports on two Arab writers. And Salma, you know, we, we had been working for a long time together on a hugely important translation project called Prota. I don't know if you know about it, but there are a number of huge volumes published by mm. Columbia University Press. But anyway, uh, Salma wrote to me and said, OK, I'm going to write about Adonis. You write about Nagi Mahfouz. So I wrote a report on Nagi Mahfouz, and I, it, it was sent to the Nobel Committee. And... Uh, in the aftermath where everybody was saying, oh, I nominated Mahfouz and I nominated Mahfouz and, and, you know, who's Roger Allen saying he nominated Mahfouz? I have the correspondence with the Swedish Academy to prove it. <laughs> that, yeah. you know, that they received my report, they used my report, and um, it had a major role. Because I was told that in 1988, the Academy Committee actually had been meeting for months and had been thinking about two other authors. And they split right down the middle and couldn't agree. And it was extremely late in the year for them. They like to have things settled by May. The yeah. announcement's made in October. Uh, they said, okay, uh, we, this, and this is the, the chair was Horace Engdahl. Uh, th they said, okay, we won't take either of these two. Who else have we got? And that's when, guess what? Wow. <laughs> uh, Mahfou Mahfouz's name came up. He was on, he's been on the short list. You have to be on the short list to win. There's a long list and there's a short list. Mm -hmm. uh, and they took my report and read some of his works. They read the trilogy in French. It wasn't available in English yet. Uh, Philippe V. Gros, wonderful French translation. Uh, and then uh, they read uh, God's World, which they had. And, well, no, as you know, as I can yeah. say, the rest is history. Amazing. Okay, I want to sh uh, shift gears a little bit. I want to talk about your relationship with um, Jabra Ibrahim Jabra ah. and uh, the relationship with Abdullah Rahman Munif. Mm -hmm. um, so, Tell us a little bit about this this kind of funny triangle um, uh, and what your relationship was like with these uh, these characters, these incredible well, characters. In the middle of that photograph is Adnan Haider, who was my junior mm -hmm. colleague at Penn at the time. He suggested that we joint translate Safina, Jabra's novel. Mm -hmm. And we wrote to him, or rather Adnan wrote to him, and Jabra wrote back and said, absolutely. And Jabra came to New York. This picture is taken in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, if you can believe it. And um, I got to know Jabra. And, of course, what uh, part of my CV, which doesn't normally get rid out, is that um, I'm a musician as well. Yeah, I'm we'll church, talk about I'm a, it later. I'm a church. I'm a church organist. I was the organist of Cairo Cathedral for a long time. Um, but Jabra is absolutely crazy about classical music. Yeah, I went to his house once in Baghdad in 1988, and he showed me his collection of uh, records. I mean, huge. And um, so we started translating a Safina, and we kept sending versions of it to him, because you probably know, Jabra is a, an incredible translator himself. Not mm -hmm. only that, but his first two novels, he wrote in English while he was in England. And um, 
he translated into Arabic um, Shakespeare's sonnets and his tragedies, and to me, incredible uh, Faulkner's uh, Sound and Fury, including all these Southern colloquialisms and all those things. So um, what happened was that when <laughs> yeah. The United States decided to invade Iraq, right? And all that kind of stuff. And Jabra was confined to his house. I would regularly send him cassette tapes of me playing the organ and or my choir playing music. And this reached the ultimate stage when really? <laughs> in, in, in Al-Bahth and Walid Mas'ud, he sent me the novel and he said, on page, and I forget which page it is, on page so-and-so, there's a reference to that personal piece which you sent me uh, three months ago. Wow. So he said, you now have an actual presence in a modern Arabic novel. <laughs> yeah. But, um, as you rightly said, I mean, Jabra was the driving force to persuade Munif to start writing, and he, that was really quite late. I think Monique what's the, may have what's been, their relationship? What was what was the basis of okay. their relationship? How uh, did they know each other? Munif, believe it or not, uh, had a PhD degree from Belgrade. Yeah, he was like an in, oil uh, in economist petroleum or economics, yeah. and he was appointed petroleum advisor to the Iraq Petroleum Company. Yeah. So he was in Baghdad, and Jabra had this honorary position as artistic advisor to the Iraq. Petroleum Company, which of course was a basically a sinecure, but but they got to know each other, of course. And Jabra wow. was immediately aware of the fact that Monif should not be mucking around with oil and oil economics and should be writing. And um, it was he who recommended that I work on this work you've got up there, which is one of his very early novels. Yeah. Not the earliest of all, but um, one of his early novels, which are very much concerned with yeah. the Saudi Arabia desert and things like that. I would imagine, I mean, in my sort of imagination, Munif strikes me as one of the most fascinating characters Indeed. and somebody who uh, you could spend just hours upon hours talking um, about their their views of the world and um, what was your relationship like with him when, once you got a hold of him? Oh. Did he strike you as not quite the same as the rest of the literary figures that you had encountered? Yes. Uh, well, th this photograph of, of Monif is taken in my back garden, of my house where I'm sitting now. Uh, he came to Philadelphia and stayed with us with his wife for wow. a week. And uh, another photograph, which you don't have... Um, his wife got fed up because at that time we had a dog. And, you know, if you read endings, there's a central character who's a dog uh, who works with the primary <laughs> character. Uh, and she says, she would continually say, stop playing with the dog. But he was continually concerned about the dog. He took the dog's walks. But... You know, that's a, a personal aside, but he was incredibly erudite, incredibly widely read. And by the way, he, like Jabra, was absolutely in love with Western classical music. Wow, really? I took him to the church where I was organist, and we were having people to dinner. But I had to play the organ for him for two hours. And he just sat there and listened. I said, we've got to go back now, we know. He said, no, no, I want to hear some more. This, this is the way you hook them. You hook them with your... Well, your... well, yeah. You know, the other one, exactly the same experience, was Mohamed Barada, the Moroccan novelist. Yeah. I've got a picture somewhere of him sitting exactly where I'm sitting in that picture. He says, we take a picture of me with the organ in the background. I said, well, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Munif, wow. Munif, uh, you know, actually went to France for a significant period of time after leaving Iraq and settled in the city, port city of Boulogne, 
and he wrote to me, I have a, I have a whole file of letters of, of Munif. My letters with Jabra have been published in, uh, in Jusur, the, um, the Washington magazine. But uh, my letters with Munif, they, over and over again, he would write and he would write about music and he would write about his novel. He wrote, he was the one who wrote to me about his trilogy. He said, I've written yeah. a trilogy called Mudun al Milh, Cities of Salt. And um, so I, I bought them and I read them. And Peter Theroux got in touch with me saying, Roger, are you going to translate Cities of Salt? And I said, no, I wasn't planning to. He said, OK, then I'm going to. And he made this arrangement with Random House, I think it was, to publish the three volumes of the trilogy. Well, later that year, Munif wrote me a letter and said, um, oops, there's been a change. What was a trilogy is now a quintet. Nine and five, yeah. Because he added, uh, what's it called, al Bat, and I forget what the last one's called, um, I'm getting to the age where the memory is not quite what it was. Yeah, but, that's no, okay. But anyway, um, <laughs> and Peter went back to Random House and said, guess what? It's now a, a quintet. Random House refused to publish the last two. So the first three are published, but the last yeah. two aren't. So I mean, speaking of Cities of Salt. Translation, that is. Yeah, let's, uh, this reminds me. So are you concerned... Uh, with the commercial viability or the commercial performance of translations, do you feel like you have some sort of ownership over how well received commercially uh, your translations are? Um, let me talk about translation generally. Yeah, um, sure. I can now announce that I'm, I've been this year's chair of the Banapal Prize in London. So I've been very involved and concerned. I would make this statement now. There it seems to me to be a radical difference now between the presence and uh, publication of translations of Arabic literature in Britain as opposed to the United States. The position in Britain now is heavily influenced by the presence there of Banipal, the magazine, in London, mm -hmm. and that um, there has been a distinct diminution, <clears throat> as far as I'm concerned, a diminution of interest in the publication of Arabic literature works in the United States. Uh, a number of university presses that were involved in doing it have, for a variety of reasons, most of them financial, decided not to do it anymore. We, of course, bless him, have Michel Mushabek with Interlink, who yeah. continues to publish works. But um, apart from Syracuse, which is continuing to publish the, the translations, many of the translations that I do, the situation in the United States is considerably less favorable than it is in Britain. And Britain, of course, even so, lags far behind uh, France, Germany, and Spain, and Italy when it comes to Europe. Uh, France is by far and away the culture and language which publishes the largest volume of works of modern Arabic literature and translation. And but, uh, um, yeah. in Italy and Spain, in Italy and, and Germany, um, it's very much the work of individual writers, translators. Isabella Camera da Flito in Italy and Hartmut Fendrich in Switzerland, Germany, who have been primarily responsible for encouraging presses to publishing, publish works of literature. But the other interesting thing which is happening is I'm noticing a gradual shift in Britain from people like myself, who are scholars, teachers, and researchers, and translators, and the emergence of full-time professional translators. And mm. there are three or four in England now who uh, work full time. Um, and it's interesting to note, particularly to me, that several of those translators are directly in touch with Arab authors about the projects of translation yeah. and the eventual publication. 
So this is, to me, a shifting scenario. Do you, but um, I, I guess I was thinking about this idea you, um, with uh, books that are extremely successful um, commercially and sort of uh, critically in Arabic, in their, in their uh, original language. Do you feel a responsibility to make them similarly as successful when you translate them? Is that something you're even success? Of course, I mean, by uh, in this case, uh, exclusively in terms of uh, popular appeal. Uh, like I'd say, it, it varies widely yeah. according to two principles. One, uh, how well known is the author? And two, which culture, country, do they represent and how uh, how interested is the Anglophone readership in works from that particular culture? Mm -hmm. uh, the, in, in other words, I worked very closely with Hanan Sheikh, for example, on The Locust and the Bird, which you've got up there now. Yeah. But um, another author who I consider extremely important, who I've translated, is the Moroccan minister of religious affairs, Ahmed Tawfiq, who is much, much more difficult to persuade publishers to publish because he's a scholar, a philologist, a historian, and also a very prominent uh, Moroccan Sufi. Yeah. And parts of that are certainly uh, present in his works. Interesting. Okay, I want to uh, talk to you about one final question before we do the quick Q&A, which is, um, we've spent most of today talking about your work as a translator, and not mm -hmm. much time uh, talking about your contributions to, um, to sort of uh, the academy and some, um, some of the work that you've, uh, some of your scholarship. And so I'm curious about, in your own um, conception of of your career. Do you think of Do you think that um, translator is one of the first nouns in your biography and your own personal um, role and contribution? Do you think of yourself as a translator uh, first and foremost, or do you think of it as one of the secondary or tertiary things that you do as part of your career? Well, I mean, because of my university position. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not the only one. No, I, I certainly regard myself primarily as a scholar of modern Arabic literature, or if you like, a scholar of Arabic literature, because Cambridge asked me to do the uh, Arabic yeah. literary heritage book. I mean, yeah. Cambridge wrote to me and said, why is it there's no single work in English about Arabic literature uh, for the past 50 years or so? Gibb wrote one, but isn't there anything... Hasn't literature studies changed, et cetera, et cetera? So this, the, the book, which is up now, is, is a shortened version of the larger Arabic yeah. literary heritage. But the specific answer to your question is, I regard my translation role as definitely secondary. Um, <laughs> now, I, just before we came on, I went to my own seat. I've just reached 40 translated works of modern Arabic fiction. <laughs> In, in published, so I can't say it's you not know that I secondary role in translation. <laughs> I have, but I, and I've got three novels uh, in press right now, all by Reem Basuni, the young uh, young. Well, she she was young when I first knew her, but the the uh, Egyptian uh, historical novelist. Hmm. Um, uh, but no, it's my scholarly career, and above all, the uh, wonderful set of people who I've been privileged to teach and introduce to the field that's that's my i regard that as my primary role amazing um okay let's do the quick q a then we have a couple of questions in the chat so the first question is what are you reading or watching and maybe i'll even add to that listening to right now since you're such an avid musician um well what i've been as i say i have just translated three historical novels by Reem Basuni, and she tells me that I'm about to get a fourth uh, in February. Um, they, they are all set in Egypt. 
the first one will be called Sons of the People and is about the building of the Sultan Hassan Mosque in Cairo. Reem, who teaches at the American University in Cairo, she's actually a, a linguist, um, but she's also a scholar and fan of Egyptian architecture. The second novel is about the uh, Orabi Rebellion in 1882. And the third is called Al Qatar and is about the building and destruction of Ibn Tulun's city uh, right alongside the wonderful mosque, which is still there. So um, I've, that's, that's what I've been reading. Um, I, I, of course, try to keep up with what is going on in the field writ large. But um, in general yeah. these days, I'm leaving the research dimension to younger scholars and, and primarily, in spite of what I've just told you about my priorities, I, I am now, yes, if I'm doing anything in the field, it is translation. Yeah. Do you, just out of curiosity, for my personal curiosity, do you, have, do you uh, watch any sort of mindless television uh, or movies that you just like to sort of unplug from? You yes. unplug? I, I, I love to read uh, uh, detective crime fiction. Um, <laughs> Great. P.D. James, um, with a whole series of others. And um, on television, I watch uh, Father Brown, and who's Chesterton, and uh, uh, Vera, um, who is, um, what's her name? Um, oh, I'm blanking on her name. Uh, Anne Cleves. Okay. Uh, but uh, any of those things. Uh, I like watching nature films too. Okay, great. But you see, I spend a great deal of time playing the piano. Yeah, well. I wanted to ask you, um, who are some of your favorite composers to play? Uh, obviously, uh, piano, uh, Beethoven, Chopin, Liszt, Rachmaninoff, Debussy, yeah. uh, Grieg. I play uh, all of them. Some of the heavy hitters. Okay. Um, who would you love to shadow for a day past or present? Um, Edward Said. At any specific age? Um, well, you see, here we go again. You, I don't know if you know this. Edward was a superb pianist. I do know that. Uh, and we had many conversations. Um, I remember once Mahmoud Darwish was getting a prize at Swarthmore College just outside of Philadelphia. And Edward was introducing him and they came to dinner. Uh, at one of our friend's house. And Edward came over to me and said, Roger, you're an organist, aren't you? And I said, yes. He said, do you know Max Rager? And I said, oh yeah, I know Max Rager. I play a lot of his stuff. He said, good, okay, get some food. Cause I want to talk about Max Rager as I'm learning one of his piano pieces. Cool. And <laughs> we spent about an hour talking about Max Rager and the, everybody was trying to talk to Edward and they were saying, no, I'm talking to Roger Allen about Max Rager. <laughs> but so um, cool. no, I mean, he's, such a widely read and deeply, uh, what's the word? Deeply emotional person. I mean, yeah. seeing that picture of him with his son Walid uh, standing opposite his former house in Jerusalem, I mean, that, that's just a killer, really. Yeah. But he, he was a wonderful scholar and a wonderful person. Um, what do people most misunderstand about your work? Um, well, the, the, the fact that um, as my career has developed, you know, I, I gave my Arabic novel first in 1978 as three lectures at the University of Manchester. And what I have become increasingly aware of as time has gone on is that, and we, we were talking about uh, the historical dimension, the fact that I often quote Oscar Wilde, who is not generally known for more serious statements, but one, the one statement I love to quote of him is, the one thing we owe to history is to rewrite it. And I, I'm so aware that nice. throughout my career, 
Now, like everybody else, I originally concentrated on Egypt and Sham, shall we say, you know, Lebanon, Syria, and maybe Iraq. But it was my colleague, who's now a professor at Oxford, uh, Mohammed Salah Omri, who pointed out to me, where's the Maghrib? And that was when, in the 1990s, I specifically decided to concentrate on Maghrebi literature uh, and spent a great deal of time there and have published a number of novels because there aren't very many Maghrebi novels in English. But Once again, um, it's somebody... But, you know, the, fact, the fact that really now we have to be able to write a literary history of, where do you want to talk about, uh, Qatar, the Arab Emirates, or Saudi Arabia? <laughs> I don't think there's a single Saudi novel in my book on the Arabic novel. But, yeah. you know, uh, as things have progressed and as the movement of interest in Arabic literature across the spectrum of the Arabic-speaking world has developed and changed. Um, I am acutely aware of the fact that probably what I wrote four or five decades ago uh, may be of historical interest, but it doesn't, quote, cover, unquote, the situation as it is now. But uh, I'm, I'm not quite clear right now whether... I, I, I have constantly refused requests to do a third edition of my novel book because to me at least i, ca I can't do that anymore There's someone else, someone else should be writing it that's that's well, how you feel no wh whether it's you know i discussed this with sabri hafiz who of all people was the one probably who had the broadest knowledge of modern arabic fiction across the spectrum um i think we both agreed that one the arab the creativity in the arab world is so diverse now. And incidentally, the distribution of books within the Arab world is particularly poor or non-existent in many cases. Uh, but quite apart from that, the development of different theoretical approaches to the study of fiction now means that, you know, wh whether it's uh, feminism or genre theory or whatever spectrum you like to Discuss, discuss modern Arabic fiction. It's not possible simply to write, well, I don't think it's possible now to write a book called The Arabic Novel, the way my, my earlier one was. So, so I'm acutely aware of the fact that that, that particular work uh, may have a historical role to play, but it's no longer an adequate summary of, of the creativity which is currently going on. Yeah. Okay, last question I'll ask is, outside of your profession, whose work do you admire or are inspired by? Oh, boy. Um, probably uh, it would not be a person, it would be a group. It would be um, the, it's called uh, Sabil. It's the uh, American Christian group that works to support the Christian community in Palestine. Interesting. I'm not aware of their work. Okay, great. Um, okay, we have one question in the audience and Catherine asked me to read this. I'm gonna to try to paraphrase the question. Um, she asks, how do you see the current very positive wave of translations from Arabic of Arabic fiction, mostly novels from Arabic into English? There has been a steady growth and there are many truly outstanding translators, but do you think it's uneven? Is there too much left to chance in terms of the selecting the works to translate? And um, there seems to be a preference for translating current novelists rather than older deceased ones. For example, um, so much of the great Munif uh, has not been translated into English. What can be done about this bias? Yes, uh, that last point is one that I very, very much agree with. Um, no, the, the, the author who uh, occurs to me is uh, Rabi Jabir, who really should be much more translated than he has been. Um, but 
this emphasis on the contemporary is something that uh, I certainly uh, have found uh, somewhat aggravating because I am not sure that uh, a great deal of what is translated uh, really deserves to be translated. And I am not sure that the process of translation and publication really takes into account in any way, shape or form the reception of the work in the target culture. Um, that uh, what kind of work do we want to translate? And no, I, I will again say that I have very recently been involved in this particular issue as chair of the panel of judges for this year's Banipal Prize. And uh, choosing a short list from all the works that were presented uh, was really quite hard because, well, I was not the only one on the panel who really wondered what kind of readership is this translation supposed to be addressed to? I mean, who, who, who will want to read this? Uh, 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 so, yes, I mean, I will plead guilty to the fact I have had a personal relationship with every single Arab author I've translated, except for Moelehi, who happened to be dead. But I, even there, I, I, had, I got to talk to his nephew, who was still alive. But um, apart from that, the issue of, of... I have only ever translated a work that I wanted to translate. In other words, I made the choice. Um, there is, as I sort of intimated here uh, earlier, I think, a tendency now for some translators to accept offers of translation from authors or publishers uh, frequently uh, with uh, money attached to it, mm -hmm. um, whether or not um, one, they like it, and two, it will be well received, or whether it will be appreciated by the target readership. Uh, yeah. And this, this, as I say, I see translation, particularly in Britain, in a transitional phase now. Interesting. Um, in the United States, less so. Um, <clears throat> As I say, because there, there, there's the translation prize at Arkansas, uh, Syracuse has a series, and Interlink is publishing. But um, everything else is somewhat isn't. There's no sort of organized process for submitting translations and having them uh, evaluated and then published in the United States. Yeah. In the same way. I, I mean, I, I referred earlier to the Proto Project of the 1980s and 90s, run by Sama Jayusi, where Columbia University Press published a whole series of very, very large anthologies of modern Arabic literature and individual works. But that's, that's simply gone by the board, largely, I think, because of the budgets that universities give to university presses. Yeah. Well, Roger, thank you so much for joining us, sharing your time and your perspective with us. It's a huge thrill for us um, to be able to have this conversation. Well, I, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. So this conversation will go up on the podcast and on YouTube in a few days, or actually it will go up tomorrow. So if you know anyone who would be interested, please share it widely um, and we will see you at the next event.